Hello again. This is the third video for um, to give you an idea of how to use this wonderful little device, the Primera. Uh, the, the first video was just a quick overview of the features of the device, the various programs that you can find on it, etc., how to use it. The second video, the last video we did was about the clinical background against how would you approach various clinical conditions such as pain management or the need for muscle strengthening. This one is actually going to go over each of the programs in order to give you an idea when to use what program for what conditions. So matching the programs on the device to the conditions. There's two slides in this whole slide deck that I think you might want to print out and hold for ready reference. Although the same tables and the same information is also printed in the user manual. So let's go. So rem remember in the first video, we spoke about two clinical cases. So let's look at them again. You've got a 62-year-old male, status post, left total knee replacement. The patient is in this nursing home. He had surgery two weeks ago. He's got a variety of risk factors for falling. Fall risk is high. There's diabetes, there's de deconditioning, there's fear of falling. He has pain and he actually fell three months ago. The problem therefore is weakness. If only you could strengthen this guy, it would be great. Things would go better, fall risk would be less. The problem, however, is that he doesn't participate in therapy well because he's scared of falling, he's got pain, etc. So you need the Premira in order to actually break through this, this dilemma, I call it, the clinical dilemma. The second case we looked at was a 55-year-old female, equally problematic for a different reason. She's had a CVA, right hemiparesis, it's flaccid, the shoulder is subluxated. She's in a nursing home. The CVA was six weeks ago and because of the subluxation, she's got a lot of pain in her right shoulder. This pain is already starting to refer to the elbow and the hand, which is the beginning of a shoulder hand syndrome, which is not good. The problem, of course, is she's weak. If only she was stronger, the shoulder would be better positioned and there would be less pain. She also has less efferent drive, so there's less information, neural drive going to the muscles and therefore they are allowing the shoulder to sublux. The dilemma is that the pain that she's got makes it that she doesn't want to exercise. She doesn't want to move the shoulder at all. And this can actually, in this particular case, can easily lead to um, what we used to call pseudex dystrophy or today we call it complex regional pain syndrome. Anyway, these problems we can't get through without some help. And the help here that I'm positioning is using this device, electrotherapy. It's a very easy way to do it and it's a very effective way. So let's see how you would do that with Primera for these kind of clients. So I told you in previous videos, you've got two types of programs. You've got TENS programs and NMES programs. On this slide, you see all the pain control programs, the TENS programs. You've got P1 all the way through P7, seven different programs, seven slightly different parameter sets. And then you've got a final one, which is the Han program. Now remember when I discussed in the earlier video, the pain control approach, the, the kind of mindset that you have when you do pain control, you either want to inhibit pain right now using the gate control theory, or you focus more on having the body produce some chemicals, some endorphins and cephalins, and some endogenous opioids, we call that group, and that pain relief will then last a little bit longer. Many times you'll find yourself doing a little bit of both, but depending on what you want to achieve, you'll, you'll pick one more or more or less than the other. So let's look at how these programs fit in that way of thinking. The first two, programs one and two, and programs six and seven are really good and appropriate and fit the model very well for gait control. So let's look at the differences in the settings. P1 is a continuous outflow of current at 80 pulses per second with a phase duration of 200 microseconds. P2 is similar. It's a higher frequency still. It's 150 pulses per second, but the phase duration is a bit narrower. If you compare these two, they will do more or less the same thing. So you might ask yourself, well, when do I use the one or the other? It's hit or miss. Try them both. In one, what I will often do is I say to myself, okay, patient, I think you need this gate control theory right now in order to allow me to inhibit your pain. I'm going to start with P1. 
If that doesn't work, I may switch to P2, but I'm still going to pursue the same type of idea. P6 and P7 are also higher rate programs. If you look at the rates, it's 100, then 65, then 100. So what the machine is doing on P6, it is switching between frequencies, but the frequencies are high. It also switches between phase durations from 200 to 100 to 200, and it does so continuously. What that constant changing does is that it prevents accommodation. The body can't get used to the sensation, and that's a good thing, because as long as you feel it, you get the pain relief. So P6 is more or less the same as P7. Similarly to P1 and P2, they're very much the same. So if I make it simple, if you want gate control, if you want pain relief right now, pick P1 or P2. If you're concerned about accommodation or if you also want to prevent accommodation, pick P6 or P7. So that's that one. The next group of pain control programs on here is P3, P4, and P5. They are all focused more on having the body produce these endogenous opioids. Let's look at them each in, in sequence. P3 is a low rate constant program at two pulses per second. So the patient will feel pop, 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 pop. That's how it feels. The phase duration are very wide, 175. If you look at P4 and P5, they are bursts. If you look at the burst frequency, it's still two stimulation cycles per second. So it still feels to the patient the same way. Pop, 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 pop. It's, but every stimulation is no longer a single pulse, but it's a burst of multiple pulses that are 200 in the case of P4 or 75 microseconds long. And in the case of P4, there's 150 pulses of those. And in the case of P5, the same way. Uh, the rate is 150 pulses per second. So the way to compare it is kind of like comparing a single shot to a machine gun. So in P3, you have a single shot twice a second. Pop, 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 pop. Whereas in P4 and P5, you have two bursts every second. Pra, pra, pra. <laughs> I can't do that properly with my mouth, but you get the picture. So it's two bursts per second. What does that do to the patient? It feels more intense. Every burst is also much longer than a single pulse. It's 60 milliseconds long. So if you want opiate release, P3 would be a good starting point. If you want to make it more intense, go to P4 or P5. P4, because of the wider phase duration of 200, would be a little bit stronger, a little bit more intense than P5. So P4 a bit more intense than P5. Then the next one, the last one, is an interesting one. It is the Hahn stimulation. Now, until not too long ago, I had never heard of this, and I've looked up the research, and it's actually quite interesting. There's not a heck of a lot of research, but there's a fair amount, and this came from a Chinese physician by the na last name of Han, and he was focused primarily on stimulating these endogenous opioids, and he found that if you have the stimulator alternate between a low rate and a high rate at regular intervals, the blood levels of the endogenous opioids is maximized. So he turned that into a program and here is, here is what it is. So it's a sequential low and high rate for three seconds each segment. So for three seconds, it's two pulses per second. And then for three seconds, it is 70 pulses per second. So much higher. The phase duration alternates from 250 to 150. All you need to remember of this is that it will feel very much like pop, 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 pop. It goes, it goes from very brief, very intermittent to a much smoother, stronger stimulation. And again, the research suggests that this maximizes the amount of endorphins in the blood. So to back up one more time, if you want to do gate control, P1, P2, or P6, P7. If you want instead to go to the opiate control, go opiate release, go to P345. Or if you want to do that with the Han stimulation, you will get the maximization of that um, opiate. You actually even have a bit of the gate effect because of that high frequency. But since it's only three seconds, we don't know how much, how strong that is compared to traditional gate. 
Okay, now let's move to NMES. NMES, there's P8 through P13, so it's six programs all together. Let's, you, if you look through them, you see different ratios, different frequencies. Let me organize them for you. If you look at the even numbered programs, P8, P10, and P12, they all have a frequency of 12 pulses per second. 12 pulses per second, when you turn up the intensity to a muscle contraction, seems like a, like a tremor. It is not a smooth tetanic contraction. You therefore typically don't use it in muscle strengthening programs where you are trying to work either on endurance or um, explosive strength. These lower frequencies are often used in order to manage tone, to try and decrease tone of a muscle that has increased tone, and they're also often used to manage edema. So how do they differ, these three programs? Well, if you look at the number, the, the microseconds here, P8 is 200, P10 is also 200, P12 is 250, a little bit stronger. But the biggest difference is the duty cycle. In P8, it's five seconds on, five seconds off. So for five seconds, there's gonna be the tremor, and for five seconds, it's off. In P10, it's 510, so it has more rest. In P12, it's got 15 seconds rest, even more rest. So why would you pick the one over the other? You just observe the patient in terms of their response. All of them can be used to manage muscle tone and edema. Some patients respond better with more rest, other patients respond better with less rest. So you have to, it's again, a bit of a trial and error. Traditionally, you start with the most conservative setting, which is more rest. So you'd start with P12, and then when you think the patient is improving, bump it up to P10, maybe even to P8. There is no absolute rule for this, and I know that sometimes sounds a little bit vague, but there is just no evidence to guide us on this realm, on this, uh, on this topic. Okay, so that's those three programs. The other three programs, P9, P11, P13, the odd-numbered channels, they are to improve muscle strength. Here again, the main difference, well, the main similarity, first of all, they're all operating at 35 pulses per second. This is a rate at which you get a nice, smooth, tetanic contraction. It is not too high, so you don't get fatigue, and it's high enough to get a good contraction going. The phase duration, again, is similar. So let's not focus on that. Let's focus again on just on the duty cycle. For the first one, it's 8.8. For the next one, it's 6.12. And for the last one, it's 6.18. So the easiest one in terms of load on a muscle, again, is the last. The six seconds on is less intense than eight seconds on. The 18 seconds off is three times as long as the six seconds on. So there is more rest in total than 12 seconds off. So 18 seconds off is more than 12 seconds off, but it's also a three to one ratio compared to the two to one ratio of P11 and the one to one ratio of P9. So in other words, if you really wanna max out a muscle in terms of its workout, you would go to P9 because it's a one to one. They get very little rest. Now, when I say maxing out, that means this load on this muscle is relatively intense. It becomes a little bit less intense with P11. It's only six seconds on, 12 seconds off. And with P13, it's even more rest. So you can think of it that, one, of that way from one perspective. However, the biggest variable that determines whether you are working more on endurance versus Explosive strength, like I explained in the previous video, is what do you make the patient do while all this is going on? I made a big point in that last video to say, make sure you make this patient exercise when he feels the current, so work with the machine. So let's say you're using P13 here for six seconds, it's gonna be on. Well, during those six seconds, do your work, do your exercise. So let's say that that exercise is a reaching exercise to grab a cone and then bring it back, and it's an exercise for a stroke patient maybe, and you're asking him to do that multiple times during that six seconds. Then he does that for six seconds, and for 18 seconds, it's off. If this is an endurance activity I wanna do with this patient, then in order to make this a little bit more strenuous, I bump it to P11. Okay, do it again, same activity, 
You bring it back and you do that for six seconds, but the machine will make you do that again quicker. Instead of after 18 seconds rest, it's now 12 seconds rest. And then finally, to make it even more intense, I'm gonna to go to P9. Now you keep doing this not just for six seconds, but you do it for eight seconds and you get only eight seconds rest. So you build up this way. You could do this for endurance or you could do this for explosive work. The exercise is the big one that changes. Okay, that is it for this presentation. I hope that it helped. So you've got pain programs, you've got exercise program, I mean, um, NMES program, muscle strengthening programs. Pick the program the, that fits your needs the best. Start with that. If you want to increase the effort a little bit, change it a little bit, it's all yours. Thank you.